Okay, so good morning, it's me again. Uh, uh, let me briefly introduce myself, Alexander Voita from the University of Zagreb. Uh, we also uh, I work at the Department of, uh, sorry, uh, the other one, <sighs> early mornings. So uh, we also extensively collaborate with Genos and Glyconage. So this, these technical problems are a nice way to announce a little bit of a technical talk about how to squeeze the last bit of information from glycans as, for, as, as well as we can. So without further ado, you, many of you might recognize this, um, uh, this graph from either a paper that you read or you, uh, you authored. Um, and I wish I had a penny for each time I read an introduction mentioning an intricate network that, that controls glycans and IgG glycosylation in particular. Um, it is a daunting task to extract information from this, um, uh, from this type of uh, network. Of course, uh, those dealing with genomics have it relatively easy, a nice linear thing to work with. However, in principle, all the information is contained there with inputs from the environment. And that's where the, where the other layer, epigenetics, comes. That happens to be the focus on, of my work, epigenetics of protein glycosylation. And when we um, start analyzing how proteins are gly glycosylated, uh, we see, um, as you can see in those um, brown uh, rectangles, uh, there are enzymes that actually uh, carry out the glycosylation. But how they're regulated is quite complex. You can see a network with some uh, notable, well-known uh, transcription factors that intersect with many uh, cellular processes. Just uh, think of RONX1 and RONX3. And um, uh, there are some feedback loops. Uh, there is a very nonlinear dependence in this case, which makes it whatever method you apply to analyze uh, glycomics data uh, a daunting task. Uh, we do know pretty much everything about, uh, about the pathway, uh, but how it is regulated is another story. And um, uh, also we have Here's another classic. Uh, oh, this is the input data. Now, there is a reason why I put it here, because um, it, is, uh, it contains some entropy of its own. So it contains a lot of variability in itself, and it sums to 100%. There you go, one uh, degree of freedom less. Let's say we have 24 peaks. That's what, what we need to deal with. If one peak goes down, other, others must go up. We just ignore it. Very elegant solution to this problem. And um, this can be considered an input. And uh, what do we want to predict with it? Let me digress a little bit. So um, there is, uh, we attempted to measure entropy of the glycome. And entropy is very intimately uh, connected with information. But entropy is not information. Shared entropy between two systems is information. And um, uh, that, that is to say, uh, if there is uh, entropy in one system that we can use to predict um, the, the states in the other system, and it works both ways, that we have shared entropy, then we can say that one system contains information about the other. Now, if we look at this Venn diagram, um, we, we, can, um, we can see that if this overlap is large, uh, then we have a lot of information in one system about the other. If these circles are completely disjoint, uh, then we can, uh, we have no information there. And um, when analyzing lichens, fundamentally, there are two main approaches. 
One is to painstakingly unravel this, what we call, intricate network of regulatory factors. And um, I'll talk just a little bit about it later. And uh, the other would be the black box approach. That's how I decided to call it. A black box would be some system that is in itself uh, complex enough to capture this complexity and that can be trained. Um, so, about unraveling uh, this network step by step. We did it, for instance, when we wanted to see uh, the relationship between IgG glycosylation and estrogen signaling, and sure enough, we found some intersection uh, there. But how did, we, how did we do it? Well, we use uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology there. And um, uh, it's a neutered CRISPR protein. It doesn't cut DNA. You'll he hear a bit more about it later in a later talk. I have some insider info on that. And um, we just uh, put different domains for methylation or demethylation of DNA, which are epigenetic signals, or uh, late as of so several years ago uh, for histone modifications to switch the genes on or off. And uh, uh, what we can do with it is, okay, we regulate the genes that were identified, let's say, in a GWAS study. There are candidate genes. We up and down regulate it. We tweak them, turn the knobs, and we get some results, hopefully. Um, and we can say, okay, RunX3 uh, run and SPING4 uh, seem to uh, down-regulate P4 GAL1, for instance. Uh, this takes a lot of work. And uh, this is also uh, because of the correlations be between the glycans and uh, the network structure. One might not always get what they expect. It's usually best to look one step ahead and uh, not too far because it's difficult to analyze. Uh, speaking of correlations, and this is a good starting point when um, thinking about an approach to data analysis. Um, we can see that uh, there are clusters of very high correlation in the glycomics data. What does that mean for us as someone who wants to squeeze that information out? Well, if we could go um, through that untangling approach that I mentioned earl uh, earlier, uh, it, is, uh, it is difficult because uh, we are changing several things at the same time. And um, we can also use, let's say, some version of that black box. Uh, pro many of you probably heard of um, decision trees and their big brother, random forests. Uh, they will sp fail spectacularly on highly correlated data as will some regression methods. Uh, because they typically the failure mode is they will latch onto one of the correlated parameters and think this is important and then in a related experiment they will uh, pick another randomly and give us absolutely no insight into what goes on. So um, uh, as for regression, what we have that kind of deals with this type of data uh, is elastic net regression. And um, we have some other ideas as well, which I'm very excited to uh, speak about. So which challenges? So what do we actually want to do? So in, in principle, uh, we could uh, use uh, glycomics data uh, to infer uh, some in interesting physiological or clinical parameters. Now, uh, the original motivation might sound unusual, but it is also unusually useful. Uh, sometimes we have glycomics data and um, uh, some parameters are missing. We might be able to impute them, uh, not just using some classical method, but with, uh, with a bit more nuance and hopefully much more accuracy. Um, further, it can uh, guide uh, clinical testing 
oh, your cholesterol seems to be high based on glycans. How plausible is that to say? Let's see how that plays out. And um, of course, um, as uh, this type of research progresses, we might move on to, and that is the ultimate goal, that would be the next step. This was just the first, um, uh, the first piece of research completed. We'd love to just feed the model um, uh, glycomics data and have it come up with, oh, you might suffer from this or that condition and then do uh, further testing accordingly. So that's about the usefulness of the approach as we, uh, as we can see it now from our horizon and how this works. Remember when applying essentially same uh, uh, for two projects with essentially same stuff, hey, chat GPT, could you please reformulate this? That's essentially what's behind it. So it's, uh, it's the new fad, deep learning, but there is something deeper about it. So uh, how it works, uh, it's relatively simple as a concept. So we have an input layer where we put our inputs. Let's say uh, uh, relative percentages of different glycans from our 24 glycan peaks. So we will have 24 inputs there. And um, then uh, we do some algebra with it. And uh, instead of giving an answer or trying to find out, we have the activation function. And that's the salient difference between classical regression methods and deep learning. Deep learning is several layers deep, an arbitrary number of layers, usually not too many, but uh, a number of layers and uh, they can be large or small. These are called um, um, hyperparameters, not metaparameters for some reason, and uh, they need to be tuned. There is also the activation function. So that's the, that's the whole point. It breaks, uh, breaks this into true layers of activation instead of just uh, functionally being one huge layer. That would make it essentially similar to a classical regression, accomplishing nothing, uh, not, not a single step further from it. Um, at the output layer, on the other end, uh, we have what we want to do, uh, what we want to find out. Let's say we have these lichens, these 24 peaks. What is my hemoglobin level, if we can predict it? And um, uh, the system needs to be trained first. And training is not unlike any normal, uh, normal classical um, uh, 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 regression-like method. Uh, it applies biases and it, it applies weights to these uh, connections in, in between neurons. They're all in principle connected and we say, okay, uh, let's do so and so much activation. And um, I don't want to go into details. The, um, um, the method is called backpropagation and essentially it's, a, it's, a ver it's an ingenious way how to uh, train this network. So the idea is that it is complex enough to capture the complexity as a black box that we do not need to understand analytically, yet give us some meaningful answer. And uh, we started with some cohorts, and you can see a lot of clinical parameters. I wanted you to see a huge block of text because we need to sift through it. Let me uh, uh, just uh, illustrate with some uh, honorary mentions. Body height, do you think it's plausible to predict it um, uh, with glycans? Neither do I. And that's uh, always a good thing to have, uh, to know, okay, we, this is unlikely head circumference or uh, how much bevanda someone has. For you, those of you unfamiliar with it, it's an atrocious Croatian custom of putting water into red wine. So uh, we have a wealth of data, but we might want to focus on biochemistry and physiological parameters. And um, after some sifting, 
um, spoiler alert, uh, body height from glycans doesn't work as expected, which is a good starting point because I'd be very upset if it did. Um, we, had, uh, we, had, we worked with two cohorts, uh, one from the island of Korchula, the other from Vis. And um, gender or biological sex was one of the inputs. Unlike anything, uh, anything else on this list, um, uh, the, um, uh, I'll come to that later. So we trained for all these potentially interesting for healthcare or uh, uh, for guiding diagnostics from Lycoming's data, and then we validated it on the VIS cohort of similar size with some of the measurements missing. So we couldn't do the whole thing. And this is what we got. Um, in green, you can see, uh, 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 so the higher uh, the column, the worse the prediction. And uh, we can see uh, the relative uh, error. So in green, it's, the, it's this deep learning approach. And um, in uh, orange, it's uh, just an uh, elastic net regression. And if you look at the training cohort, uh, you, you can see that they perform about as well, meaning typically uh, that they are able to squeeze out similar amount of information from the input data. However, when we did validation, we were pleased to find out that uh, deep learning uh, performs better on the data from another experiment, uh, comparable, compatible, but uh, technically a completely different experiment. It outperformed um, uh, ElasticNet for many, um, uh, for many of the parameters, meaning it is good at generalizing. It makes sense. Uh, of course, for sanity check, well, we checked whether it can guess the sex because um, we wanted to know, okay, if we feed you an input variable, are you able to classify 100% of the samples? Yes, it can, and I'd be really upset if it couldn't. It means there, then that's something that went terribly wrong. The other things are guesses from the model, and some of them are uh, some of them are useful and we're working on actually applying them uh, for prediction of what might be outside of the reference interval given uh, uh, a glycomics measurement. Of course, one always needs to look at the data. This is heart rate, by the way. Heart rate from glycans. Um, now, um, this, this is like a nightmare. Oh, I got a nice prediction, everything fits, everything's fine, and then we rattle the cage and see what comes out. Oh, in, the, in blue, the blue, solid blue dots are uh, ranked uh, observations, and the red dots are corresponding, um, uh, the corresponding um, uh, predictions. And we can clearly see what is going on here. If not, let me briefly explain. The model is trained by uh, minimizing a loss function. A loss function. So it tries to do, OK, I get penalized for bad predictions. I have no idea how to predict heart rate uh, from the glycans. So I will just use the mean and, on average, make the least amount of error. Now, if this happens, it goes straight to garbage. We don't use that one. It needs to track the blue line to be useful. So it's always, always good to uh, just plot data. Those who use R know that once it's all up and running, you just need a few lines of code to quickly check, and it's really worth it and sometimes insightful. So what does this? deep learning, except for being a new fad maybe, bring to the table? Well, uh, it's relatively insensitive to correlated data, which we happen to be dealing with. 
uh, it's very flexible in types of inputs and outputs. We switch to another method containing, say, 27 peaks instead. We just retrain the model. We want some different outputs. Uh, maybe some diseases or conditions that get flagged accordingly. We can do that uh, using pretty much the same thing. Once those, the architecture of the network has been established, it's relatively easy to get a, uh, uh, to get a rough idea of what works. And um, uh, it um, seems to be able to generalize better than the traditional methods. And that's, that's the strength. That's well, where we can say, OK, this is more modern. It's not a fad. It actually performs better. And um, just from the implementation perspective, uh, this heavy lifting, the backpropagation, the training, uh, it is also already uh, implemented and freely available in several different libraries, whichever you prefer. So uh, implementation is not overly complex, though understanding of the limitations as with using any, um, any method is essential here. Um, so what do we want to use, uh, use it for next? Now, uh, we want to refine the model somewhat. It's almost in production already. Um, to uh, guess uh, for this glycan age analysis, to not, not only guess your age, but give some more insight and say, oh, your glucose might be out of uh, the reference interval. You better get it checked. So kind of useful there. Hopefully, we move forward and um, get, to, um, uh, get to guide the diagnosis of some uh, uh, diseases and conditions. I listed those that we know that glycans contain information about because of other bodies of, of extensive research. What would we need for it? Well, we would need cohorts with the response variable, of course. And um, the take home message would be uh, glycans do contain valuable information about health and physiological status. So sometimes the correlation might seem straightforward, sometimes it seems striking. Oh, I, I would never think that they could predict this or that, but they in fact can, and it can be validated. And in this case, the black box approach can be useful without years of working on untangling a regulatory network. We get, uh, we get a model that gives us some predictions. And um, uh, this deep learning approach, yes, it does gener uh, generalize well. Uh, and. Um, it's a good idea to try it out. So, uh, thank you. Uh, you can see some friendly faces here sitting with us. Uh, this is the group from the university, from him later, so he's in the other part of the picture. These are the sources of financing who make everything happen. So, and finally, I ran out of creative energy, so there is a thank you in uh, the worst font possible. It's Comic Sans on the worst color background, which is, of course, teal. So thank you so much, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Not too How much. Many architectures have you find? What is specific about the final architecture you think, which may be uh, of course. <laughs> the so that's determining the uh, not metaparameters, the um, hyperparameters, the network architecture. Uh, 20, 30 or so. 
uh, the general recommendation is to uh, systematically test them, like the, the depth of how many layers you have, how many neurons, or better to say units in each one, which activation function to use, and uh, there are tools that uh, help automate it, uh, the process. I did not use one, but I think you can test a, a lot of architectures with those tools. They do exist, and the process is essentially trial and error. Days to the whole couple, couple couple days, but once you uh, once you get grip, okay, this is my input data and this is what it responds well to, then it's a very good starting point for refining it. Or if you need to repurpose it, you know, okay, I know I need about three layers with sixteen neurons in each or uh, something like that. So it will typically How work. We went with um, two hidden layers, uh, 16, oh, I, I'd have to look at it. It was either 16 or 24, but they did not perform uh, very differently. So just blindly adding more layers or, or, or more units, will it makes things worse. One needs to optimize and find a sweet spot. Thank you very much. The study on those two cores with all the many parameters that you measured, is there a reason why you didn't include age, which would seem to be another sort of sanity check? Oh, yeah. um. I, uh, we already uh, do it. Uh, it, it just, uh, uh, I think we tried it. Uh, uh, we did not focus on it because we have other methods within this glycan age, so uh, the idea was not to duplicate the work, but uh, it is a reasonable predictor of age as well. I, I didn't, didn't include it here, but uh, it, it can do it. Okay, if there are no other questions. If there are no other questions, I would like to invite our next speaker.